stream on YouTube. So, um, okay. And then I can officially start. So, um, welcome everybody. Welcome here on World Virtual Tours. So my name is Patrizia. I'm an art historian and an archeologist, and I'm living in central Italy in Umbria. I live in the typical Umbrian hills, the green hills in central Italy. And um, so I don't live very far from the capital of Umbria, which is Perugia, and Perugia is only 25 kilometers away from Assisi. I must say Assisi is the place where I guide uh, the most in person. You know, sometimes we are sitting there near the Basilica, the world famous Basilica of St. Francis with my colleague guides. And we say, you know, we have a beautiful office, you know, we really have a beautiful office. Um, so that's just, um, well, a little inside joke. And so today is the uh, second installment of this free academy. Um, so we're going to talk about St. Francis and Assisi and especially, of course, the uh, St. Francis Basilica. So um, let me then share my screen and start the presentation. Okay, so here we go. So, um, yeah, this is World Virtual Tours. You know World Virtual Tours has also the free academy. So I have four installments. Last week, we talked a little bit in general about the history of Assisi and about, you know, the times of St. Francis. Today, I'm going to talk about the lower basilica of St. Francis. So I know there has been a mix-up, I think, with the titles. Um, so I only saw it today. That So but today, I'm going to talk about the lower basilica. And then next week, I'm going to talk about the upper basilica of St. Francis. Francis. And then um, in uh, two weeks, I will be inside the Basilica. I have, a, I have a special permission from the Papal Basilica. It's, um, you know, normally when you go inside the Basilica, you are not even allowed to take a photograph. So um, it's really a very special permission that I will be live stream from inside the Basilica. And so it's always nice if we have these introductions, you know, so that I don't have to waste time inside the Basilica with the general history, I mean, not waste time, but, you know, so, um, yeah, um, that's uh, it. And then, you know, everything is based, of course, on donations. So it's a free academy. But so if you thought it was world, while, uh, world worthwhile, so you can always leave a donation. Uh, there will There's also the link in the chat. So let's start with San Francesco or St. Francis. So just to remind you uh, the times we are talking about. So St. Francis, he lived uh, for 44 years. So he died when he was 44 years old. So he was born either in 18... 1181 or 82, but he definitely died on 12 in 1226. And he was canonized very, very rapidly because only two years, I mean, not even two years after he died, he was canonized. He was canonized by Pope Gregory IX, who came personally to Assisi to have the canonization ceremony. And the, next, the day after, he put the first stone for the construction of the basilica. Now, um, last week, I didn't have time to mention Saint Claire or Santa Chiara in Italian. So her name Chiara means clear. And um, so she lived at the same time as St. Francis, but she was something like 12 years younger. And um, she was almost 60 years old when she died. But so um, Santa Chiara was, of course, a very important companion, very important um, character in the, in the life uh, of St. Francis. So she was from a noble family, so from one of the most important noble families of the whole area in reality. And her parents had destined her, of course, for a marriage with somebody else. But she, uh, well, she didn't want to do that. So as a young girl, she heard talk about St. Francis, who was already very famous. And so she started to collect you know, food or or um, or clothes. You know, to send to the poor people, to send to Saint Francis and his community in uh, the valley. But after a while, she, she thought it wasn't enough anymore, and she said, "I really want to dedicate my whole life to this new project, because I just want to remind you that." the philosophy or the spirituality of St. Francis in those days was something quite revolutionary. Um, and the church in the beginning, you know, the official church didn't really know what to do with it. So at the end of his life, St. Francis was uh, acknowledged. Um, you know, everything was okay. But already, you know, you know, some decades after uh, St. Francis's death, the church, you know, started to... Um, 
well, not really to change, but to reinterpret uh, his teachings and, uh, you know, to make it a bit more accessible also. But so St. Clair, she was, uh, you know, a revolutionary young girl, you could say, but also, you know, in those days that wasn't really accepted. And um, so when she founded her the community, you know, the community of the uh, poor uh, ladies, of course, today we call them the poor Clares, but I mean, St. Clair, she didn't call herself a Clare uh, sister, of course. So the community of the poor ladies, um, she absolutely uh, wanted to do the same as St. Francis. You know, she wanted to live in total poverty. You know, she didn't want to sleep in a beautiful house or on a beautiful bed. She wanted total poverty, but that's something that the popes, because there have been several popes during her life, never have accepted. So she had to accept the fact that um, well, you know, so that she wasn't allow allowed to, to have a ladies' community that would go into the world. So um, the poverty was acknowledged, but only if she would accept to be uh, in a cloistered uh, community. Now, this is a picture of the St. Clair's Basilica in the town of Assisi. And um, so um, and the, um, the sisters are still there. So there are still poor Clairs or something like 40 uh, Clairs in the, um, in the convent. The convent is really on the right hand side uh, of this church but St. Clair she started something somewhere completely else. So yeah these are the famous um, buttresses to sustain the St. Clair's church because you know when they build it you see they only built the central part and so immediately there were some stability problems so on the left you see they had to add these, these, yeah, quite um, large um, and a bit plump, you know, not very elegant um, um, buttresses. But today it's very nice because, you know, you can walk underneath, you have these beautiful uh, look throughs, as we say. And on the right hand side, if you look carefully, they also had to add extra sustaining structures, but that became part of the church and part of the convent. And so, um, yeah, here you can see today it's nice to walk underneath. And so in the church, there is the tomb of St. Clair. The, the tomb of St. Clair is empty because 150 years ago, when they built a crypt, so, you know, when they wanted to make the tomb accessible for the pilgrims, so they built a kind of floor underneath the uh, church. And so in that occasion, they opened the tomb of St. Clair. And so they took out the remains, which were just some bones it was not an incorrupt body and they put these bones in this kind of wax um effigy so what you see is not an incorrupt body or a mummy so it's a representation of saint Clair with the bones that they found in the tomb inside but saint Clair, you know she has never lived of course in the saint Clair's church or in the convent of the Clairs in assisi but outside of assisi here so this is a church of san damiano so perhaps you recognize it from last week, because um, this is where St. Francis had this kind of calling. So um, if you look carefully to the facade of this church, you can see that in origin, there was only the uh, left part of the, um, the, um, the, the left part of the um, building, you see with this circular window. So it, it was like half only of what you see now. Uh, so that was the church, so the left half was the church. And um, yeah, so um, you can also see underneath that kind of portico, there is underneath the round window, there is the actual entrance door of the, the church. But of course, later on, the you know it became a monastery and it became very large. And so they built a lot of other structures. But so in the days of St. Francis, there was only the church. And um, St. Francis, he sent St. Clair to San Damiano. You know, San Damiano had been a kind of ruin in the days of St. Francis. St. Francis had rebuilt that church. So he had collected money to rebuild that little church of San Damiano. And when St. Clair was looking for a place to stay, he sent her to San Damiano. And so she didn't live in the church, but above the, also in the attic. Look, if you look at the, the round window, you see there is a, a wooden door uh, on top of it. So more to the left of the round window. So there's a wooden door in the wall. And then there's a tiny window also. Um, so um, if you would open that door, you would be in the attic. So you would be a above the vault of the church, under the roof. And that's where St. Clair lived for 40 years with her first um, followers, with her first uh, community, with her first sisters. So when you arrive to San Damiano, it's beautiful because it's just outside of the town. Um, you can walk there between the cypress trees, between the olive trees. It's really a peaceful place. And um, it has to be kept uh, that way. That was, by the way, one of the conditions of the um, of the last 
owner of this piece of land with the San Damiano church. And it was a Scotsman. It was a Scottish uh, person. It was a Scottish uh, lord, um, the family Kerr, so K-E-R-R, I hope I pronounce it well. Um, and um, so um, he, in 1983, he gave it to the brothers, but you know, the brothers, they don't, they, are, they, they don't own it really, but so he gave it to the minor brothers, um, but under the condition that it would remain a, a spiritual place, a peaceful place um, that, um, you know, visitors, I mean, couldn't, I mean, they had to be in silence. It couldn't become a Disneyland or anything, couldn't be any commercial activities around. So that was the strict condition. And so when you go to San Damiano, it's really a really peaceful haven, at least if there are not too many people around. And so when you walk up to San Damiano, there is this field of olive trees. And then in the middle, there is a statue of St. Francis. You see St. Francis who came regularly to visit, um, you know, the Clare sisters. And um, here he's uh, sitting there in the midst of the olive trees and he's looking towards a very precise point because if you would follow his gaze, you would see there is, of course, the Portuncola. So the place that he called home, the place in the valley where he spent his, uh, you know, his religious life. Now inside uh, San Damiano, this is how it looks like <clears throat> in the interior of San Damiano. Uh, there have been, of course, you know, uh, over the, the centuries, there have been some, you know, <clears throat> well, um, adaptations. But what a lot of people don't see, you know, because you see on the right hand side, there's this kind of iron gate. So the people who come to San Damiano, you have to enter through that iron gate. So from the side. And when they enter, of course, immediately they look towards the altar. And on top of the altar, you can see this big crucifix <clears throat> that is a copy of the original crucifix of San Damiano. And so the people go there and then they start to walk around in the monastery. But almost nobody, when they come through the gate, they normally go to the left. But you should, because there is this very remarkable fresco, this painting <clears throat> that represents the, yeah, the special episode when St. Francis you know, he went into the church, you see him on the left, you see he's kneeling, unfortunately it's very damaged, the fresco, but so you see he's kneeling in front of the crucifix, so he gets the calling, Francis go and rebuild my church because it's collapsing, and so the first thing he did was to collect money to rebuild that little church of San Damiano, and in the middle of the wall you can see this kind of window, and uh, now it's walled up, now it's closed, but that window was an open window, and so um, St. Francis, he put the money that he had collected on that window, it's, it seems, you know, to give it to the priest of the church. And then you can see what happens on the right hand side when he comes back home. It's not really, I hope you can see it. You can see a man with a stick and he is just underneath the town of Assisi. You see the town of Assisi with the town walls and the town gate. So when uh, St. Francis had given the money there in the window, to the priest, he came back home, but then his father stood there with a stick, you know, to beat him up because he had also taken money from the shop, from the business of the father. And so that's a fresco. It's also very dark. A lot of people don't see it. But so if you go there, go and see it because um, it's a curiosity that, you know, is always overlooked. And then, uh, of course, you can visit uh, the, the, the places where St. Clair lived. So here you can see the little choir. Um, that this this is just behind the altar, but uh, you cannot see it from the from the church. So um, it was of course the private place for the Clare sisters, since they were obliged to live cloistered, so they couldn't be seen, and so they could follow these services without being seen. And um, so it seems this is really the original, you know, the original very simple, you know, furniture, the benches of the first sisters, and then you have to go up a very steep and narrow staircase. And on the right-hand side, there's this door with the window. There you can look into the little garden. They call it the little garden of the Clare sisters. And then you arrive in this chapel. This was the private chapel of the sisters and um, the and, and St. Clare. And um, unfortunately, just before the altar, I couldn't find a good picture, but there is a hole in the wall, uh, in the floor. So they could actually see and hear the services from above right, by opening this, this, this stone in the floor. And um, then from there you can access, so this is the attic, you see, this is the attic. Uh, and so this is where St. Clair lived um, with her first 
sisters for 40 years, four zero, 40 years. And then you have this view in the courtyard. It's all beautifully kept, uh, very peaceful, very silent. This is where, an, um, this is the first building that was built next to the church. So the first annex. And that is where the sisters then cooked and had their meals. Um, with the, uh, you can see these benches. So this is another picture. It's really beautiful, always peaceful. And um, and then, so this is the crucifix of San Damiano. So the original is now in the St. Clair's church. Because of course, you know, it was in the San Damiano church. But after the death of St. Clair, she died in San Damiano. But after she died, you know, her body was transferred to the town. And they immediately started to build the St. Clair's church. And so when the church was finished and the, the convent for the sisters was finished in town, of course, the sisters moved to the new convent and they brought this crucifix with them. So they were all, they always cared for it. So this is a crucifix of, uh, you know, the end of the 12th century. So this is the speaking crucifix, the talking crucifix. As we say, here you can see the typical representation of Jesus Christ with his eyes open, without any expression on his face, you no know, completely straight body and with a lot of care. So if you can't count all the heads, you arrive at 30 different, um, you know, uh, characters. So um, typically a Byzantine shape also. So that is the crucifix of San Damiano from the end of the 12th century. And um, now it's in the, you know, in the St. Clair's Church. Here's another view of the St. Clair's Church. But so you know that with St. Francis, who always wanted to emphasize the human aspect of Jesus Christ, the human aspect of the church and of the saints, for example. So that's when in the, in the arts, you know, we are going to have a shift towards the crucifix on the right, where, we, where they're going to represent the suffering uh, uh, Jesus Christ. So with his eyes closed, so this is the human Jesus Christ. The one on the left is the living son of God. On the right hand side, we have the suffering human Jesus Christ. And that is really a new um, way of thinking. So the humanization that the artists are going to follow thanks to St. Francis. And so here you can see, uh, this is the crucifix by Chimabue, uh, by the way. Um, and so um, here you can see how the the face uh, of, of Jesus Christ is represented in a suffering way. So this is not really a portrait, as you can see. This is not an, um, a realistic representation of a face, for example. But, you know, they want to express the, the suffering. And this is a crucifix that was made a little bit later by Giotto. And here we can see, you know, between Giotto and Cimabue, there, you know, Cimabue was the, uh, the teacher, so the master of Giotto in the beginning. But here we can see how the, uh, how the pupil, how Giotto is going to uh, come to a much more natural uh, representation of the body, of the, also of the suffering. And so you can see that there's a huge difference between this face uh, and, and, and here, this face, you know, which is much more uh, natural with this sagging body. So um, already here we can see Chimabue Giotto, and those are names that are will come back today and also, uh, you know, next week. So let's go to Assisi, let's go to the Basilica, so the, the St. Francis Basilica. And so um, here on this picture, this is the kind of square that was built in front of the church, um, of course, to, to have a lot of space for all the pilgrims. So sometimes when there are holidays or on Sundays, it's so crowded that, you know, that it's really very full uh, there still uh, today. And so in the background, you can already see the basilica. And so today we're going to talk about the lower basilica. And so um, you will ask me, you know, why are there two basilicas? Where is there an upper and a lower basilica? Well, you have to know that, um, you know, when St. Francis died, he was buried in a little church in the center of town that doesn't exist anymore. But immediately they started looking for a piece of land. And so um, a first piece of land was donated on the edge of the hill by two private uh, people. And um, so when it was on the edge of the hill and it was a large piece of land, so there was space enough to build a big church. But the problem was that it was a very steep area. And so um, here, if you look at this um, kind of model or pro well um, design, so um, on the right hand side, you can see the facade with the triangle and the circular window of the upper church. But so um, if you 
then continue from the, the facade and you would go inside the church, you would see that at a certain point, you wouldn't be on solid ground anymore. And because there is this very steep, steep area behind, well, not even behind the church. And so they first had to build a kind of terrace. So, you know, you need a kind of flat terrace, so a foundation before you can build the actual church. And so the project was very simple. So first we're going to build this foundation, but you know, it's not that we're going to keep it empty. We're going to immediately um, transfer the body of St. Francis there. And so if you look at the bell tower of the church and then you go down, you can see that underneath the upper church, there is you know, these vaults, it's the lower church. And in the 19th century, they dug, so they really dug out from, from the rock, they dug out a lower level even, and that's the crypt. So today there is a crypt with the accessible tomb of St. Francis, but that is something from the 19th century. So until the 19th century, that lower level didn't exist. There was only the lower church and the upper church. And the lower church is the foundation of the upper church. So the upper church is standing exactly on the lower church, and um, here with the red arrow, I just wanted to say that there's a very steep drop there. Look, look on the left of the bell tower. So that, uh, you know, it's really, if you go there, it's really very steep. And so here you can see on the left, that's the lower church. And on the right hand side, you have a map of the upper church. And so you really should put them, you know, the upper church on top of the lower church. So they are standing exactly uh, on top of each other. But at a certain point, um, there were some problems because um, you have to know in the original plan, there was, so the, they built the lower basilica. So the, the, the church, so the map, I mean, the, the drawing that you can see on the left, they first built that, but it just had the shape of the T. So um, you see what is below and then all these chapels left and right, they didn't exist. So there was only the, the T cross, you could say, the letter T. And on top of that, they put, you know, the, the, the upper church you can see on the right. But very soon, you can imagine, the walls of the lower church, they started to have some trouble in sustaining the upper church. So they had to add all these chapels left and right. So um, that's today, you know, you see the lower church, you have all these structures left and right. So that was not in the original plan. So here you can see how the church, so this immense structure, is standing over a kind of ravine. <laughs> uh, so you see all these buildings behind the church. Those are parts of the uh, monastery of the Franciscan monks. So, um, you know, they were built over a ravine. That means it's like a huge fortress with huge, huge walls. So this is the inner courtyard, I mean, one of the courtyards of the uh, monastery. So you see there are two levels, and then beneath that level, there are two other levels. And so it's really um, a very um, steep area that they had to build over. And so this is uh, the apse of the churches. So um, if you look on uh, to the picture on the right-hand side, so you can see the, the three windows on the top. Those are the windows of the upper church. And then just below that, you have three tiny windows. Those are the windows of the lower church. And then below that, you know, in this portico, you have also kind of black door. Well, that is the level of the crypt. And so, and then, and then you have to know that there are two floors even below that. So just to give you an idea how steep everything was. This is a very rare picture. So um, I will never have the opportunity, I think, to take this picture again. But so here we are on the side of the um, lower basilica. And um, so that's not normally not accessible. That's only for the monks. So you have to know that the monastery of the Franciscan monks is extraterritorial. So um, this is not Italy anymore. So this is uh, the city of the Vatican, the state of the Vatican. The ch church is not, the church is property of the Vatican. But so here we are extraterritorial. And so normally you are not allowed to walk around there. So this was, you know, in the dark with a special permission, uh, you know, only some guys we were invited to, to visit. And so here you can see where we are next to the church. And look, um, in, in the background, you can see the lights, you know, of, of the valley. But look how, I mean, I hope you see how steep it is. So just behind this. So, and on the left, you have these kind of fortress walls that sustain the whole monastery. And so we were allowed to see the oldest parts of the church. 
which are, um, you know, just behind the lower church and a level lower. So, you know, I, I had never entered there before. So this was two years ago. Um, so um, you have to know when St. Francis died, the um, community, so there was immediately a little community that um, stayed on that particular spot because that piece of land had been given. And so they stayed there. So they had this little church. And so that's what we saw. So before the upper church, um, you know, was was really finished and the, the, and the low. So that's really remarkable. So the, this is the oldest part of the whole uh, structure. And, uh, and then we were allowed also to see inside the monastery. Um, we had to keep completely silent because there are also the novices there and they couldn't be disturbed. <laughs> and then we saw this incredible hall. This, so this is the refectory, so where they eat. So where the monks eat. So nowadays there are 60 monks um, and sometimes guests, but... Um, Yes, so you see there is a spot for many, many more. And then look at the painting there in the background. You know, so it's just a flat wall, but yeah. So just to tell you, oh, you see how, how huge this hall is. <laughs> so really incredible. And then, uh, yeah, and then paintings of, you know, the Last Supper. Okay, and so this is, now we're going to enter the basilica. So the entrance of the lower basilica is where you see the letter A on the right-hand side. So... That's the entrance of the basilica. So you can see this is a lateral entrance where normally you would expect an entrance on the right hand side. And so normally you think, you know, you would enter through a central door. Well, there is not there is no door there because in reality that that's the rock. That's that's a, that's a cliff. And so um, you have to enter from the side. And then um, what you can see is immediately in front of you, you have where the there's the letter F. That's a chapel, the St. Catherine Chapel, but it's um, that's new. I mean, that, that was built much later on. So the um, oldest part, oldest part of the church is when you enter A, you have to go left towards D, as you can see. I, I don't know how else I can explain it, but so um, D. And then you see all these structures left and right of the central aisle. Um, yeah, perhaps I should have turned this around. But so, um, you know, for example, B and C, those are chapels that were built later on. And then, for example, just that, now that I see it, G, the letter G is the bell tower. So the bell tower in origin was outside of the church. So it was outside of the walls. But when they added the chapels, you see there is one corner at the top left corner, that became part of a chapel. So just to tell you that these chapels were added uh, later on. And so um, this is a view towards the altar. And so um, you see you have a blue ceiling. And I think, I have, yes, if you look carefully in the blue ceiling, you see these stars. But in the middle of the stars, you have pieces of glass. So that would, in those days, it would reflect, of course, the candlelight or the torches, so to have a bit more light. So if you look carefully, you see those, this is not painted. Those are all little pieces of glass in the center of the uh, stars. And uh, so this is a view towards the altar. So you can see the altar. You can see on top of the altar, there's a, a crucifix. And underneath the altar, that's where the tomb of St. Francis is. So St. Francis was transferred there in the, in, the, in a kind of building site. I mean, it was not finished. Um, but so they decided to transfer the body of St. Francis there, um, you know, before they would build uh, everything, um, you know, also to uh, admit also already pilgrims to go there to, to visit the building site. And, um, and of course, then they were encouraged to donate also something, because if you see f what you're paying for, so it seems there were really stalls with, with building stones, so you can pay a stone or two stones or half a stone. And so if you see what you're paying for, perhaps you will give a little bit uh, more. And so the tomb of St. Francis was excavated in the rock underneath today's main altar. So, and until the 19th century, the people, they had to queue up to the altar to you know to be as near as possible to the tomb 
uh, perhaps you can see in this there there are some steps in front of the altar and there is this kind of rectangular black window so that is really a hole it's a hole in the um it's a hole in the um in the in in the yeah, in, in the rock. And so that's a direct contact to the tomb of uh, St. Francis. So until the 19th century, that's what, that was the only way to have a contact with the tomb of St. Francis. But so in the 19th century, the monks, during the night, because during the day they couldn't, of course, disturb the pilgrims, during the night they excavated. So you see where this lady is standing on the left uh, with this kind of striped uh, shirt. So um, that's where they started to dig. So um, they, they were not really sure where the tomb was located. I mean, there was this hole, but they said, you know, is it there? Is it not there? We cannot destroy the altar because they had to do it, uh, you know, while they wouldn't disturb um, the people. And so they did it at night. And so they started from the, the place where this lady is standing on the left. And then for more than 50 nights, they had to dig you know, and they dug towards the main altar and then they found the tomb. And so um, then they decided really to, to make a whole floor, so to make a whole crypt underneath the altar. So now you can go down and this is what you see. So you go down uh, some steps. So now we are underneath the lower basilica. And so in the back, there is this, there is this, uh, the tomb of St. Francis. So um, from here, perhaps you can't really tell, but it's really a piece of rock. And so, uh, you know, with the hole in and then the remains of St. Francis. Now, you cannot see the remains of St. Francis. But so this is exactly under the main altar of the lower church. And you can walk around uh, the tomb. And so here, this is a kind of section where you can see the, the altar of the upper church is just above the altar of the lower church. And the, low, the altar is just above the tomb of St. Um, Francis. And... Um, yeah, this is, um, and so when, so in the 19th century, they opened the tomb for the first time, and then it has been reopened several times. The last time, just a few years ago, so just before COVID, um, they, they installed some new lighting, uh, so lights, and so in that occasion, they opened the tomb, and so they found uh, this kind of um, metal casket, and so inside was a glass case that had been sealed um, the last time they opened it. And so um, this is, uh, you know, the skeleton of um, St. Francis. So, um, and, uh, and in that occasion, they decided also to, to reopen another um, tomb. So here we are in another wall. And so inside the wall, you can see um, in the wall, there are some uh, monks represented. So five monks are painted on the wall. And so those are five of the first companions of uh, St. Francis. So it was also, again, uh, you know, it was all photographed and then sealed uh, again. Here you can see, um, you know, they put it back in the wall. And uh, if you visit uh, St. Francis Church, there is a chapel with the relics. Uh, for example, this was the garment that they found in the 19th century. So when they opened the tomb for the first time, this was the garment they found. So now it's exhibited. And so here you can see that St. Francis took poverty really literally. So, um, yeah. So he said, we don't need, you know, a whole wardrobe with garments. You know, one garment is enough and a belt. And um, yeah, so <laughs> that was his uh, teachings. And uh, yeah, this is something else. And okay, let's uh, go back to the altar. So... Now, you know, underneath the tomb, there is the altar. And then on top of the altar, so in the ceiling, you see the ceiling is a cross vault. So it's a vault that has been um, divided into four sections, like four triangles. And um, when you are in the church, in the public, and you look towards the altar, and then you look up above the crucifix, you can see St. Francis sitting on a throne. So on top of the altar... Yes, now we are D, you know, the letter D just on top of the altar. So this is the cross vault and you see the four sections have been painted. And just to give you an example that they never painted something randomly. It's a whole program that was established in advance. So they never said to a painter, you know, paint something nice or paint something beautiful. No, it's a whole theological program that can go very, very far. I mean, uh, really, um, it's um, and so here I can give you an example. So. Uh, you see the, the part on the bottom that's up. 
first this. So it's uh, St. Francis sitting on the throne surrounded by angels. So this is, of course, the triumph, the glory of St. Francis in uh, heaven. So that's what the public sees when they look towards the tomb and when they look above the tomb. So that's quite logical. His mortal remains are underneath the altar and on top you see him in heaven. And um, then you can see the other three yeah, I, the other three parts of the vault, they represent the three vows of the Franciscan monks. So if you know a Franciscan monk, you can recognize the monks because of the white rope they have, the white belt. And so it's a belt with three knots that represent the three vows. So they would never forget them. So the vow of poverty, of chastity and obedience. So these are the three basic vows of most of the religious orders. But um, so they are represented presented in a symbolical way on the other three parts of the vault. So um, we call them allegory. So an allegory is a you know, symbolical representation because you know, how can a painter paint something abstract as poverty? So, so I'm going to show you. But first, um, because I forgot I had put it in. So if you look towards the keystone, you know, the middle of the vault, it's the keystone. It's what we call the keystone. And on the keystone, we have this. Now, I couldn't find a better picture. But so this is the apocalyptic uh, Jesus uh, Christ. So this is, and, and in the uh, arches of the vault, there are a lot of, for example, there are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And there are several symbols of the apocalypse. And so here you can see this is a Jesus with white hair. Uh, this is also how he is described in the revelations. So I have the text to quote. Um, so let me see, because I can't. <laughs> so in the in Revelations 1, 14, 18, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. You can see it. You see these black lines on the left and right of his mouth. Um, his face was the sun shining in all its brilliance. So this is the apocalyptic uh, Christ that is uh, represented. In this case, so the, the sword is, is left and right of his mouth. In this case, he has a book and then the, the hammer, because it's also written that the words should be like hammers. You know, the, 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 the words should be like a hammer uh, knocking on a rock. And so um, you see, this is just above the altar, so just above the tomb of uh, St. Francis. And so, um, yeah, then we have poverty. Poverty is the most important uh, vow of the Franciscan monks. It was also the most important thing for St. Francis, total poverty. And it's not a coincidence that it's represented centrally. So the public cannot really see this. This was meant for the Franciscan monks. So the Franciscan monks, when they would sit behind the altar and the choir, this is what they would see, the allegory of the poverty. So you can see uh, in the middle, uh, St. Francis, who is marrying a lady. And this lady is dressed in rags. So she's representing poverty. Poverty as a virtue. You see, she doesn't have a round halo, but a polygonal halo. That is typical of the virtues. And Jesus Christ is blessing this um, union, of course. Now, behind her, you have also roses, red roses, you have um, white lilies. And then on the right hand side, this lady in green that is spes, that is the hope. So, hope is represented here, another um, virtue. And then on the right hand side, let me first show you the whole scene again. So, in the middle, you have poverty. You know, she's really centrally. You know, Jesus, um, Jesus and St. Francis on her left. And then below, you have these kind of bramble bushes. So, you know, it's not really um, easily accessible poverty. Then you see there are two little children they are throwing stones at her and there's also a little dog unfortunately i don't have the detail there's a little dog he's barking at her so you know it's not easy uh, poverty is not easy and then um on the left you see there's a kind of angel who is letting people you know who's welcoming people and on the right hand side there's an angel that is um, trying to invite some people but they go away and there are these three ones 
these three ones, they are representing a sins. You know, for example, you see this one. So on the right-hand side, the man with the stick, he also has a little bag of money. So that is um, avarice or greed, um, meanness, I'm not really sure. And then um, the one in the middle, that's um, envy. And then the other one here, that is superbia, so pride. Look, it's this one. You see he has a falcon, he's rich, you see he's very wealthy. But the very surprising thing is what he does with his other hand, with his right hand. With his right hand, he's making a very obscene sign. This sign still exists in the Italian language with the hands. I would never, do, I mean, I've never done it, I would never do it, but this is, it's very, very obscene. And um, so that's quite remarkable. You see, the angel is inviting to poverty, but you see, they are even laughing and saying, you know, it's not for me. So that is the allegory of poverty. And then, yeah, you see, there are a lot of details. For example, you can see on top of the poverty, you see somebody with a nice coat and then with a building. Uh, you see, they are, they, they are bringing it up, they are offering it. So those are properties that on, on earth, you know, St. Francis thought they were useless. So he said, we don't need stone buildings and you don't need all those clothes. And so it, they are like, bring it as a gift uh, to God the Father. And look what is very original is God the Father. He's like <laughs> leaning head first, you know, from above to, you know, to take these uh, gifts. So that's something quite original. Now, of course, who made this? Well, um, this is not Giotto, but this is clearly a follower of Giotto. I mean, Giotto, he did that for the first time. So this this head down for head first kind of thing. And so um, this is the typical language of Giotto. So it's not Giotto, it's a little bit later, but so it's typically, it's, it's a follower of Giotto. And then we have chastity. So chastity is represented by a lady in a tower uh, with a veil, uh, with two angels. Wait, I have the details. So one is bringing palms and the other one is bringing a crown. So she's high in the tower. Uh, and then underneath, you see two other words, santa, so th those are virtues again, munditia, which is cleanliness, and fortitudo, which is fortitude and strength. And they are just uh, underneath her. So here, yeah, mm, I don't know if I have the detail, but so to access chastity, you have to be, you know, um, uh, you have to be strong and you have to be clean, so pure. You see, there's all, also somebody who is getting, is it a baptism or is, is it a, is it? a bath you know cleaned it's, it's something boat really and so on the left again we have oh i'm sorry on the left again we have people who are welcomed by saint francis and so um, these three people are so in the background in black that's a claire sister and so what we call the second order in the middle we have a franciscan monk what we call the first order and then here in the foreground we have this character which is then the the third order. So those are lay people. So during the, his life, St. Francis founded, you know, the order of different the minor brothers, the, the uh, friars minor, then the ladies, the poor ladies, and then also the lay order. So the third uh, order. And on the right hand side, you can see who is chased away, who's leaving. So you have this kind of black spider like creature above that's Mars, that's death. So that's the death. And then we have uh, the one with the wings and the arrows uh, and these um, 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 bird feet. Um, that is amor, that is love, but it's, uh, you know, it's not really a nice love. You see, um, he's blindfolded and then he has all hearts, you know, all hearts as a belt. He is having all these hearts and he's, he's going away with it. And then uh, there is the immunditia, so the not cleanliness, so the filth, you could say. That's this lying character with the wild boar head. And um, so, and then there is the other, the fourth one is ardor, ardor. So it's um, a kind of fiery passion. I see the hair is on fire. So you see, but they are chased away. They don't belong with the chastity, of course. And then we have obedience. Obedience, you see, there's a little building which is a, a chapter house. Um, and then on top, St. Francis is standing. And there are two little hands again that come from above and put something on his shoulders or on his neck. It's not really clear. And um, some people say it probably was a crown. Uh, other people say, no, it's a yoke. Because also in the building, you can see there's a kneeling Franciscan in front of the uh, obedience. 
the obedience with the square um, halo. And so um, obedience is putting a wooden yoke on the shoulder of this Franciscan monk. So a yoke is is to make oxes uh, obey. And then again, on the left and the right, there are several characters. So, oh yes, here we have a detail. And also obedience says, you know, you have to be quiet, you know, don't complain, you have to obey. So, you know, don't say anything. And then on the right hand side, there is uh, humilitas, so um, humilitas, humility. Um, and there is this centaur that is, you know, being chased away. The center is uh, centaur is in obedience. And then on the left we have uh, prudencia, prudence, who is typically represented, you know, with two faces. So one in front, because she always has to see what is behind her. That's also why she often has a mirror. So she has a mirror in one hand, and in the other hand she has a compass, so a drawing compass. And um, that that little thing in the middle is an an astrolabium, so it's something to see the, the stars, I mean, to calculate the stars. And um, because, you know, prudence, prudence is also wisdom. So you have to be prudent. And so you need to, um, you need, um, you have to know things, you know, so in order to, um, to get around, you know. And then you see beneath there, are, again, there are two people who are allowed, you know, be, or, welcomed towards uh, obedience. So you see, it's not just anything. I mean, they also took into account who saw what. So the people they see, you see St. Francis in heaven and the monks behind the altar, they would clearly see these allegories. And then uh, we go to, so from D, you see from the central part um, on top of the altar, we go to K, so on the right-hand side. So if you're standing in, to, uh, in front of the altar on the right-hand side, we have first this. So um, somewhere in the 1270s, probably, Cimabue, the famous Cimabue, the painter from Florence, was asked to come to Assisi. And um, first he painted in the lower church, and this is what he painted. He painted a maesta. A maesta is a Madonna on a throne with baby Jesus and then also St. Francis on the right hand side and then um, so the way this Madonna is painted was a revolution in those days so we saw earlier how uh, you know during the 13th century the artists are going to say goodbye to the strict living son of God on the cross and this more you know iconic so like the icons um, representation and also for for the Holy Virgins, they're going to say goodbye to the, you know, strict queens of heaven, and they will more come to the human lady, the mother, you know, a mother. And so, look, first of all, she looks quite gentle, and, um, you know, she also has a foot, uh, sweetly uh, holding the foot of baby Jesus, and then she has a body under the coat. You see, there is a body there. You can see that there's a kind of knee, you know, um, and then also the throne on which she's seated is uh, represented a bit slightly seen from the side, a little bit 3D, an attempt of three dimensions, an attempt of perspective. So, of course, it's not really right. You see the angels are standing on top of each other and not behind each other, but it's an attempt. So it's, it's an attempt, a beginning of this kind of perspective to put, you know, the Holy Virgin in a kind of space. And that is very important because by doing that, the painter is changing the point of view of the spectator. Because when you paint something like this, you are becoming the viewer. So the, the viewer is the, so it's not the Holy Virgin who is frontally looking down towards us. No, it's us. We look towards it. We become the witnesses. And so Chimabui, he painted this Madonna, but then he, it was interrupted. And then he was called to the upper church. And so that's the only thing he painted in the lower church. And the rest of the, of the, the, the vaults, they represent mainly scenes of the life of Jesus Christ, so especially at the beginning of his life. So here you can see the flight to Egypt, which is one of my favorite scenes because it's really very funny. So this is Giotto and his um, workshop. So um, there are so many discussions which details are from the hands of Giotto, but you know, every time there is a conference you know, they don't agree. So, I mean, I'm not here to, to, to tell you. I, I don't really have my own opinion. I just know this is the language of Giotto. So if he did it on his own or with his whole workshop, I mean, for me, perhaps it's not even very important, but look what they're going to tell us. I mean, without Giotto, they would never have painted like this. So this is what I mean. And so um, 
Um, here you can see the Holy Virgin on the donkey. The donkey or the mule is represented in motion. So he's walking because they are fleeing to Egypt. And then some people say, oh, the, 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 the legs of the donkey are not really right. But look, this is not a photograph. This is really to... Um, to tell us a story, you know, with some details, but this is not a photograph. And so in front, you see Joseph. Joseph is looking back. And so from his shoulders, from his like drooping shoulders, you can see he's not really having fun. I mean, is he worried? Is he tired? You know, the Holy Virgin doesn't look at us at all. You know, she's, you know, she's uh, uh, worried with her child. And then behind the Holy Virgin, there's this palm tree that bows to honor the Holy Virgin. Now, you will tell me that's not possible in real life, but as I said, this is not a realistic scene. This is not a photograph. This is to tell us, as in the comic books, you know, we have these little details that tell us, that give us some information or emotions. And then two angels flew past, or mm, better, you know, they, they raced past. Now, look at the speed of these, of these angels. You know, mm, you know, probably that's why the palm tree went over. I mean... That could be because Giotto had these. I mean, I don't know if you, if can't remember if I did a presentation uh, about Giotto, but you know, Giotto he, he had some very funny little details, like angels who the wings were too big so they couldn't squeeze through the window, and so. But so in this case, you see, well, anyway, one angel is looking in front of him because. He has to see where he goes. But the other one sees that something happened. And he, you see, he taps on the shoulder of the other one. And he said, look, look what is there. Look what is happening there. So he also uh, tries to get, get our attention to the central scene. You see, all these little details, they tell us a story. And as I told you perhaps before, this was a completely new language. This becomes a language with images. And that was new. And that happened really here in this church. So this is the famous um, birth of, of Jesus Christ in nativity. Um, you know, Jesus Christ is represented twice. So one in the arms of the Holy Virgin and just below where he is washed. So again, this is not a realistic uh, scene. Uh, here again, the angels are, you know, like swooshing. <laughs> in. Um, then, um, yeah, Joseph is a bit, yeah. He, see, he doesn't really have an active part <laughs> in, this, um, in this happening. But again, you see, the, this is full of little details and it tells us a story so that we can really enter in this uh, scene. And, um, and then amidst the whole story of the beginning of the life of Jesus, of his childhood and so on, we have a crucifixion scene. So a lot of people, they always ask me, how come there is a crucifixion scene? Well, I will tell you just in a second but first of all mm, there is also this on that side there is there is this representation of uh, saint francis with a skeleton so this is saint francis and sister death saint francis is in Kent in his canticle of creatures he talks about you know he thanks god for the sun and for the moon and for the the stars and for the water and for the wind and for and for sister death and here you can see death is represented with a crown, but the crown is a bit crooked. So this is not the almighty death who has to scare us. No, this is a kind of companion. So this was also a completely new way of representing death. You know, before St. Francis, if you go to Romanesque churches, it's full of monsters and, you know, it's not really nice. But here you can see this is a completely different way. And it's not a coincidence. This has been painted, painted just next to the door where the monks had to go out of the church towards the monastery. And so every time they would pass that door, they would be reminded of that. And then we go to the other side, to the other um, um, yeah, the other part. So you see now we go to L. So D is the central altar. We just saw K with Jotesque, so the beginning of the life of St. Francis. And then L is um, the other side that was painted a little bit later by Pietro Lorenzetti. Again, a crucifixion scene. We have two crucifixion scenes and they are parallel. Look, if, if you look on the map again, you see these two little X's. That's where the two crucifixion scenes are. So K, the, 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 the vault of K was where we had the beginning of the life of, of Jesus with the crucifixion. And then L, we have the end of the life of Jesus, also with a crucifixion. Now, these crucifixions are painted in such a way that the public cannot see them. So if you are in the church, you cannot see these crucifixions. They are only visible to the people who are sitting in section E. 
So behind the altar, so again, these crucifixions were made for the monks. So if they would look to the left or to the right, they would always be reminded of the crucifixion and of the you know, sacrifice of um, Jesus. And this crucifixion scene was made by Pietro Lorenzetti. Yeah, it's much more beautiful than on this picture. It's more than 50 characters. They're all beautifully clothed. I think, did I have a detail? Yes, here, look how they are. Uh, you know, I would be curious to know what these two horses are telling each other <laughs> because you see they're really like talking to each other. I think they're telling a joke or something. But um, well, it's it's a beautiful crucifixion scene, but unfortunately, it's um, damaged by. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's damaged by um, this. This yeah, you see this piece that is missing because uh, 300 years ago they cemented an altar in front of it and when they took it away they took away part of the fresco so unfortunately it's gone it's uh, lost um and um yeah so the rest is, is more scenes of the end of the life of jesus for example here we have the um, washing of the feet so christ was washing the feet of the apostles and here and um, this is very original because the paint had to paint this scene just above the door you see on the bottom there's this doorway and so he didn't have a nice square for his uh, fresco so what did he do he uh, painted a little wall you see the apostles are leaning with their elbows on top of that wall and um yeah so it's a genius solution for a lack of space and then um you see this is um the last supper with on the left, you see those details where they're giving the leftovers to, you know, to a dog and a cat. <laughs> um, but um, you see the, the space is a bit less natural than what we saw on the other side. So this is Pietro Lorenzetti from Siena. So um, there's, a, there's a, a difference in style between uh, the two. And then, you know, the, the, the other doorway where the monks had to go to the, um, to the, to the monastery, so they would pass it when they would go back to the monastery. Um, there is another, another representation of death. This is Judas. Judas, you know, hanged and um, so eviscerated, really. So um, that's another, you know, to remind. So here we have the two symbols of death near the doors. And then we have this. This is the very uh, famous hitchhiking Madonna. Um, Pietro Lorenzetti very elegantly painted this. So it's underneath the crucifixion scene. So the public cannot really see it. So again, this was not perhaps meant in origin for the public. But here we can see the Holy Virgin talking to Jesus or better Jesus. He says, mommy, who will be my successor? And uh, who will be my follower? And she points to St. Francis, who's standing behind her. And St. Francis answers with a gesture. He says, me? So, um, yeah. So without a word that it was written, you know, from the gestures, we, um, you know, we know what is meant. But this is an incredible statement. This is an incredible statement of the Madonna that she points to St. Francis as the successor of Jesus. Um, it's quite a statement. I don't think the other saints would be very pleased <laughs> with this. Uh, and so perhaps that's the reason why it's hidden away. Um, it's a bit hidden hidden away. So um, other people, they have an interpretation that it's a kind of political pamphlet because this was painted when the popes were in Avignon. And the popes in Avignon, they had quite some trouble with several kind of groups of Franciscans. Uh, they were also called the spirituals, for example. And um, they had a lot of problems with them because they were very radical. They preached in public that the, you know, that the popes were antichrist and so on. And um, well, um, so and that was quite a problem. And so um, one of the popes, he had a kind of um, meeting. Um, and um, he kind of abolished the whole Franciscan order and, and reinstated it himself, you know, so he really took control. And um, so perhaps that could be, this could be a re reaction to that. You know, in Assisi, of course, they wanted to stay tr perhaps more true to, you know, what St. Francis had said. But these are speculations. There's no proof uh, of this. And this is, again, a general view of the um, lower basilica, and so towards the altar. So this is from, you know, when you enter and you go left. So this is what I will be able to show you also when uh, I will be there. And then there, you see there are chapels left and right. Um, oh, yes, no. 
So, you know, uh, the lower basilica was finished quite quick quite quickly and the upper basilica so they were open to the public or inaugurated in 1253 so only 25 years after they started building which is an incredible achievement you saw the huge kind of building that it is and so um the oldest paintings of the whole structure are here on the main aisle of the lower basilica but unfortunately, when they built the chapels left and right, they broke through the walls and destroyed most of these most ancient paintings. You see, there's only little parts left. For example, this is the famous preaching to the birds painted around 1260 by the Maestro di San Francesco, an anonymous master. So that was the first one who could you know, start to paint in the church. But then the chapels were opened. You see, Chapel B is a famous chapel of San Martino uh, and Chapel C, is the famous chapel of St. Magdalene. For example, this is the chapel of San Martino. Yeah, the colors are not really... This is Simone Martini, who painted the San Martino chapel. Uh, this, this, is, this is also my, one of my favorite scenes because you see St. Martin, he's sleeping in his bed. And look at the feet. Look, you know, how clever it is to make a blanket with all little squares. So for the perspective, it's very, you know, useful. And then the little feet that are sticking out from under the blanket. So um, so this Simone Martini at his best, you see scenes from the 14th century, um, you know, musicians. And uh, then C is the Magdalene Chapel. And so that's the only chapel where all, all scholars are, uh, agree that this is original Giotto. So that this is Giotto. So that's the only ch chapel or that's the only paintings that everybody agrees about. Because even in the upper church, there are people who doubt uh, Giotto. But so this, and this is where I'm going to start the next week in the Magdalene Chapel, um, because then we can talk about Giotto and then we can move to the uh, upper church. So this is just, uh, this is, yeah, this is Giotto. Yeah. So here we are outside again. And so I will start from here next week. So um, you see, pff, the hour is already over. And yeah. <laughs> so um, what can I say? Um, yeah, so I hope you had a little impression more. So next week we will start with Jot and then go to the upper church. And then in two weeks I will be inside. I will uh, give an, from inside. Of course, it will be a different time of the day um, because, you know, I can go, only go there at 4 p.m. local time. But so I hope you will be able to join me in two weeks inside the church. And next week, a presentation about the upper church. So, uh, you know, World Virtual Tours is only based on donations. So you're a uh, very welcome to do so on the link and uh, then i will uh, go back to the zoom and then um, i don't have a lot of time left because there's another presentation uh, after me so um i will just open the chat briefly is it open yes now it's open and um yeah so you know you can uh we watch it on YouTube, also what I did last week or what I will do next week. So, um, yeah. So, um, I don't know if you have um, urgent questions. <laughs> and... Um, So let me see. Yes, and of course, yeah, on Monday I will be back with the other academy of the um, about the one painting, you know. So. Um, So the geometric patterns, I think you mean in the uh, in the arches of the vaults. Now they, they, they are they, those are geometric um, uh, decorations. If you mean those ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, every time there's a new message, it scrolls back up. I don't know why. Mm. 
Mm. Oh, I want, wonder what Fra I I wonder what France as a Fra um, France is. Mm. Francis, he was against new buildings and even buildings for himself. He said, you know, we just need a very simple hut. We don't need stone mason buildings. We don't need that. And so in the beginning, he tried very hard to fight it. You know, I, um, there is a scene that one day St. Francis, he come, you know, he was away and then he comes back to the Portiuncola. But the people of Assisi, they had built a little stone house for the monks because they said, so there will be, you know, they have a roof over their head. And St. Francis, you know, he... He, he he had it torn down several times, and so um, he of course he didn't want that kind of thing. I, the only thing perhaps that would be fun for him is the frescoes. I don't know. He wanted to tell stories. He was the one that reenacted the nativity, so with an image, so without words, he wanted to tell something, and so perhaps he would have. You know, he thought it was fun. But, you know, in the beginning, the decorations, the decoration of the church, in the beginning, there was no decoration of the church the first years because um, the monks didn't want that. They, you know, there was a whole group of monks that said, we don't want all these decorations. You know, it, it's too much money, for example. But then um, there were constantly interruptions because there were, you know, the monks didn't always agree so um yeah you know he hated money saint francis hated money it was it really was he had this kind of physical disgust for money so you know this was all financed with um, you know popes or bishops who said okay you know if you donate for the church you will have um some indulgence indulgences so um yeah So the different shapes of halos, so round halos are normally reserved for angels and saints. And then you have the polygonal ones that can be triangle, square, um, so um, can be several ones. Those are virtues or uh, sometimes also living, people that were still living. Um, the Vatican doesn't take care of the keep up, so that's uh, the Italian state because the Italian state considers there's this a monument. And um, so St. Francis, um, to get his order approved, uh, so uh, written, so that happened in 1223. So um, that was exactly 800 years ago last year. Um, and it took, it took time because, you know, St. Francis was really radical. So St. Francis was a revolutionary, so he was really radical. And you have to know that already two years earlier in 1221, he had already said this is too much for me you know i just wanted to do something with my brothers and now we have brothers in, in england and in spain and so on. he couldn't keep up with it anymore so he gave already the control over his order to somebody uh, else to an, an pietro Cattani, the poor man <laughs> so he became the head i mean the the, the responsible of the community and um, francis you know i will obey you but of course he was constantly giving you know commenting with them okay so then um, I have to, um, yes, I have to stop because, uh, so I hope to see you next week when we will talk about Giotto and the uh, Upper Church. Okay, so I thank you and um, yeah, thank you very much again. And uh, so now there is, in 20 minutes, there is a tour in uh, Mexico. So um, a presentation. So um, I don't know if it's a presentation of a live or live tour. But so, um, okay. Thank you very much again. And hope to see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.